good morning to our town United Methodist Church family and others of you who may be joining us. Thank you so much for being here today. And here we are again with me, <clears throat> staring into my laptop and only seeing myself looking back, trying to visualize you out there. Maybe we'll be back together again soon in what we might consider a more normal way. Until then, we're going to make this work. Today is Mother's Day, and I do want to say Happy Mother's Day to all mothers out there. <clears throat> I also want to give my annual Mother's Day disclaimer. I know Mother's Day is not always a happy day for everyone. There are those of you who have lost your mothers or those who may not have had a good relationship with your mother. There may be many of you who have wanted to be mothers and that uh, has not been possible for you for some reason or another. So I am going to follow my usual practice of not doing a typical Mother's Day sermon. This sermon this morning is about a wedding feast, however, and there are many mothers who can relate to that. So you can just keep that in mind and know that um, I hope all of you, whoever you are, wherever you are, will have a happy Mother's Day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we lift praises to you today and give you thanks for the blessings you pour out upon us daily. We confess that we are sinful people and ask your forgiveness for our failure to be obedient to your will. Help us be aware of the bounty that you pour out upon us and of your presence with us in our separate lodgings and accept our service of worship. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Today, let me call us into worship by reading Psalm 33, verses 1 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Delight in praise, O you upright. Praise the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to the Lord with the harp of ten strings. Sing to the Lord a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Upright is the word of the Lord, whose work is done in faithfulness. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of God's mouth. The Lord gathered the waters of the sea as in a bottle and put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe. Amen. Now, let us once again go to the Lord in prayer, remembering those around us who are suffering in many ways. And then we will close that prayer by praying together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being here with us wherever we are. This situation that we are in in the world today, battling this coronavirus is just bringing it home in a real way that you are everywhere. Heavenly Father, we, as a church family, lift up to you the many names that we have on our prayer list. We know that you know every situation intimately. You know those who are 
grieving the loss of loved ones, you know, those who are suffering sickness, or those who are uh, experiencing problems of other kinds, maybe with a relationship, or maybe with their financial status. Lord, I pray for your relief and your comfort to everyone who is suffering in any way this day. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would use this situation that we are in to bring others uh, to a point of realizing their sin and sinfulness and their need for you. Use this as a time for the redemption of the world. Heavenly Father, I pray for all of those who are in the world today, ministering on your behalf, and those who are doing all they can to help those who need help. Be with them and encourage them and enable them to do the work you've called them to do. And now hear us as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you do, please turn in them to the 22nd chapter of Matthew. And in just a moment, we're going to read the first 14 verses. I imagine almost everyone out there who is listening has at some time or another received an invitation to some type of celebration or party, and at the bottom it says RSVP, which uh, stands for the French uh, Répondé, s'il vous plaît. My apologies to any French speakers out there, but it means please respond, or respond if you please. And the reason that a host puts this on an invitation is because they would like to know exactly how many are coming to their celebration so that they can be well prepared. This is a courtesy to the guests because the host wants to be able uh, to give the best party that they can. And it is also uh, a courtesy to the host because uh, the guest is saying back to the host, we appreciate your invitation and want you to know that we either will or will not be able to be there. Now, we see uh, this RSVP sort of situation in the scripture that we're dealing with today. Matthew 22. 1-14. Jesus spoke to them again, and again he is in the temple courts, speaking to the crowd, including Pharisees. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like this, a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those that I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants 
servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The word of God for the people of God. Here, we read the third parable in a row, the third parable in a row that we have looked at uh, since we've been doing um, these services online. That seems harsh, has very harsh words and things that might not be pleasant for us to hear or to think about. But I want you to consider the circumstance in which Jesus was teaching this parable. Remember, it was after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and just before his crucifixion. This was an urgent situation for the Pharisees and for all people who had not recognized or who refused to recognize who Jesus is. Who Jesus had uh, been teaching everyone that he was uh, and who was about to truly be revealed at the resurrection. He was trying to make things very clear to the Pharisees who had refused over and over to hear his message, who wanted to kill him. That's one thing that I want you to remember about this parable uh, before we go on. And the second thing is that when we read the scripture, we often um, fall into this trap of trying to take what we're reading and stuff it. We stuff it into our mold of whatever Jesus or the world is supposed to look like according to our way of thinking. It is important for us to look at scripture and the context in which it was written and, and first read, because that will help us truly change our thinking and grasp uh, a better understanding of the scripture that we're reading. You see, in the first century, when a celebration was planned or a party was given, hosts often sent out uh, a servant, someone to go through the countryside or to the places where the invitations were to be given, and to make an announcement that the host was getting ready for a big party. So be ready when it's ready. And um, remember that in that day, there were no telephones, no emails, no texts. I don't think any stationary sh shops that sold uh, cute, colorful little announcements. And so um, the host was going to try to give some advance notice to the people he was going to invite. It was kind of like a save the date that we send out these days, except it didn't have a date. The people just knew if the time is going to come, so they kept that in their mind waiting for the next announcement. When the party giver had made all of their preparations, they would send the servants out again saying, the time has come. It's time to come for the celebration. And in particular, a wedding feast was a great celebration. The wedding itself uh, and all of 
the the banqueting and celebrating that went on afterward took a week. So it was a really big deal. Jesus told the parable that we just read uh, to these people uh, who were in the temple courts listening to his words, uh, including the Pharisee. He told the people this wedding invitation story, and they would have understood it perfectly. This was the third parable of rebuke to the Pharisee. This was a serious thing that Jesus was talking about. This was a, a point that Jesus wanted to drive home to give these people an opportunity to see that they were on the wrong path by rejecting him and rejecting the kingdom of God that was now with them. He began by saying the kingdom of heaven, because that's what Matthew called it. The other gospel writers do say the kingdom of God. But Matthew was very Jewish, and uh, he would not use the Lord's name. And so he said the kingdom of God, uh, heaven, it is the same thing as kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of God is like this. Here it is. The kingdom of God is here with you now. A king prepared a wedding banquet for his son. And he sent out these announcements. He sent out his servants uh, with these RSVP notices. The king is going to have a wedding celebration for his son, and he wants you to come. And the people he invited refused. Still, when the king followed through with all of his preparations, he sent the servants out again and said, everything is ready for you to come. But these people again refused. They were not necessarily being mean. They just decided to go on about their own business. And that was more important to them than the invitation of the king. We read the... Um, rather violent reaction of the king that this crowd would have understood uh, perfectly living in the first century in their day and time. And then the king sent out more servants onto the street corners, the highways and the byways, to round up whomever they could find because the king was prepared for the celebration. They went out to get the good and the bad, to get those who had lived uprightly and those who had not. And they were invited to the banquet. And they came. Do you remember, perhaps you do, uh, two parables ago where Jesus told the crowds um, that the um, prostitutes and the tax collectors, the low people on the totem pole of society, were going to enter the kingdom of heaven before the religious leaders would. Because they accepted the invitation of the king. They changed their lives. And so the wedding hall, the celebration place, was filled with people, just as the king had wanted. And the king came in to the celebration and happened to see one person there who wasn't dressed correctly. Now, some people say that when folks came to a wedding banquet, the host furnished clothes for them, um, maybe so and maybe not, but in any case, whether 
he was given clothes to wear and didn't put them on, or whether he didn't stop to fix himself up before he came, he was not dressed appropriately. And the king said, that won't do. You were not prepared to be in this banquet. You can't sneak in to the kingdom of heaven unprepared. Now, we can look at this parable and its negatives and uh, the harshness of it. And certainly it is there. And I uh, have chosen today not to go into all of the explanations that can be given the same uh, as, as I did next week. And I think that in this time of uh, the uncertainties of the COVID-19 virus, we have enough negativity around us. So I would like to look at the positive aspects of this parable that Jesus told us. This was a time of urgency for each of them. They might not have recognized it, but Jesus knew. And he was speaking to them in a language that they understood so that they could change their minds and truly be the people who deserved the kingdom of God, um, the ones that God had called initially, the people who had said, we will follow you, but then distorted uh, God's entire message and actually closed people out of the kingdom instead of bringing them in. We can see that there is that same sense of urgency today. You know, I haven't heard a whole lot of, of talk. Maybe it's because of where I've been listening. And I think a lot of it is because, you know, we're all pretty isolated now. But I haven't heard a lot of talk about masses of people turning to God because of this virus. And I think back to past times in my life when we have had um, an emergency in our nation and people flocked to the um, churches because they were afraid and they had looked at their lives and realized that uh, they needed God in them. Our churches are closed now and so people are not able to flock there. But I imagine there are folks who are afraid and who may never have thought about giving their lives to God before, who might be thinking about that now. We are living in an, urge, uh, um, an urgent time today. And so if there's someone out there listening, I want to not feed on your fear, but to point out the positive things about this parable. Uh, in this parable, we see that God is, the king is, is God, and Jesus is the son. And the religious leaders of the first century, the chief priests, the Pharisees, um, were those who refused the invitation because they didn't think they needed one. They thought they were in, that they had all the answers. The Pharisees themselves made the decision to refuse to come to the banquet. They put their self-interest before God. And look at what they missed out on. They didn't get to come to that great banquet. They didn't get to share in that celebration. But others, those who came from the highways and byways, whether they were deserving or not deserving, when they were invited, they came. And they got to share in that banquet, in that great celebration, in the kingdom of God, which is now and not yet. Jesus said it's here and it will come in its fullness at the end time. And those who accept the invitation 
are going to be there to eat at the great banquet table and to celebrate in God's very presence and to share in the joy that God gives out. And we're going to be able to do that because of God's grace, not because of anything that we have done except to accept the invitation to say, I will come into the kingdom of heaven. I will be a member of the kingdom of God, and I will be a follower of Jesus and a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I will work to bring others into the kingdom. They will see what my life is like because I follow Jesus, and they'll want that same thing. God pours out joy and grace upon us if we will accept the invitation. See, we talk about God sending people to hell. We make our own choice of being cast out of the kingdom when we refuse to accept the invitation. So we have a responsibility in this. We have to accept the joy and the grace and the invitation. And we also bear a responsibility for being prepared and not trying to get into the kingdom of heaven by our own means or by some way that somebody else has told us will work. We get there by clothing ourselves in the righteousness of God. And we do that, we are able to do that because of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Whether uh, you are a religious leader, whether you are a celebrity or a sports figure, or whether you um, are in a category that might be considered on the lower end of societal spectrum, you must respond. You must prepare. You must realize your own sins and sinfulness and realize there's nothing that you can do to get rid of them on your own. And you must say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And that Jesus came to this earth and lived a perfect life so that he could voluntarily go to the cross and substitute for my sins and sinfulness. And I accept that free gift of grace uh, that he gave me, that he gave me this free invitation into the kingdom, not based on my merit but just because of who he is. We must prepare ourselves and accept the invitation. I want you to take a few moments now, just a few seconds, in silence, and I want you to consider what your response has been to this invitation into the kingdom of heaven. I hope if there is someone out there who has realized that they have not given a response uh, that is acceptable to God and has put their own interests ahead of God's plan for your life, that you will take this time to ask God right now to forgive you and to let him know that you want to accept his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. If uh, you need to talk with someone about that, you're free to call me. Uh, you can look on the Grovetown United Methodist Church website, and you'll find uh, information there, how to contact me by email, and there's also the church telephone number. Now,
now uh, I want to say this to you. I want to thank those of you who have been faithful in your giving. We still exist as a church. We still are doing ministry. Uh, I asked in a daily email this past week for you to let me know ministries you've been engaged in. And I sent out the results of the replies that I received in um, the email yesterday. And I think that you can see that we are still doing ministry. We are still the church. In the meantime, we still have to maintain our building because we are going to get back into it one day, and that will be a gathering place. But I hope it's just a, a place where we come to plan and meet and get back into the world where we have really been sent. Um, and in order for us to do the ministry that God has called us to do, we do need funding. That means your tithes and offerings. Um, that means that you can still give to North Georgia Conference and United Methodist Church special offering. You may do that by uh, mailing a check to the uh, church address, which is on our website. Uh, you may send it directly to our treasurer, or you may pay uh, through your bank with bill pay. Remember that this Sunday, Mother's Day, we do take the North Georgia Conference offering for Wesley Wood. That is our Mother's Day offering. St. John Towers is a part of Wesley Wood. And all of the contributions go to house seniors, senior citizens in North Georgia. I uh, again want to thank you for joining with us today. And I have a song to recommend to you on YouTube. And it's a, a familiar one this time. One that you can sing along with, the words are there, and I suggest that you find it and just sing out heartily. How Great Thou Art by Chris Rice. Just go to um, Google. And uh, or, or to YouTube and put in How Great Thou Art, Chris Rice, C H R I S R I C E. And as you sing, think about the words How Great Thou Art. God is great. One day there will be a celebration banquet. And we're all invited. It's up to us to accept. Now receive your benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.